Howdy readers, I'm Jason, this is Chapter and Verse, and welcome to Day 2 of Jasonathon, my own personal readathon, um, which uh, Jason Harrigan, you are more than welcome to adopt as your own as well next year. Uh, so yesterday I finished uh, Philip Roth's so I Married a Communist, um, and I wanted to just talk with you guys a little bit about it. Hot on the heels of ShakeTube, it was uh, both surprising and um, kind of exhilarating for me to see how often Roth uh, references Shakespeare's works in this book. Um, there are references to the Henry plays, to Macbeth, to Twelfth Night, to Hamlet. Um, I'm probably forgetting some. But the real question is, uh, what did I think of the book? And uh, I've read a lot of Philip Roth's books. And, uh, and this is right up there. This is top tier. I didn't like it as much as uh, as I like American Pastoral, uh, which is, I would say, one of my favorite books. Um, and it was published right after American Pastoral. This is the second novel in his what's called his America Trilogy, um, which is made up of American Pastoral, I Married a Communist, and The Human Stain. Um, but really, there's only one thing I don't like about I Married a Communist, and it has to do with the st structure of the story, with the, the architecture of the narration. So essentially, um, the book begins in the present day, and we have uh, Nathan, who is I think now in his 60s or maybe even his 70s, um, and he runs into his old English teacher, uh, who is Murray Ringgold, who is now like 90 years old. And um, anyway, in Nathan's youth, uh, he had become friends as a teenager. He had become friends with Murray's brother, Ira. Uh, and so much of the story is about what happens in the past uh, between Ira and his wife, Eve Frame. So Murray is essentially recollecting the past for Nathan. And, um, and I think Roth intends us to take uh, Murray as a completely reliable narrator. However, I think the best thing that Roth could have done would have been to uh, set Murray off on uh, his narration and then given us a chunk of white space or what have you, or a new section in the book, and moved us completely into the past and given us an omniscient uh, narration. Uh, but instead, Murray is actually telling the story in his own voice through most of the book. Um, the middle section of the book is Nathan relating um, his memories of Ira in his own voice. And that makes a lot more sense because Nathan really never talks about anything um, that he wasn't present for himself. A lot of Murray's uh, narration, um, he, he's, he's relating things that he can't possibly know the details of, no matter how much he and his brother Ira might have talked about them. Um, there's just a great deal that he must be inferring, but we're not meant to take it as inference. And so I think that there is, there's a deep flaw, I think, in the, in the structure of the novel, the way in which Roth decided to tell it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, American Pastoral does something similar, where we have uh, Nathan Zuckerman and another character meeting up at the beginning of the book and then um, relating uh, something from, from their kind of shared history or what have you. Uh, but I think that Roth actually jumps back in time I could be wrong, I haven't read it in a long time, but I think he actually does what I wish he had done in this book. Um, if he didn't do that, then it could just be that he, um, that he employed the same technique as he employs here, better in American Pastoral. But I seem to remember him not doing that. Anyway, I wanted to share two passages from this book uh, with you guys. And the first one uh, occurs right on page two. And it's extraordinary, um, seems to me. An incipient craving for social independence, however, had to have been nourished somewhat by Murray's example. And I told him this when, in July 1997, for the first time since I graduated from high school in 1950, I ran into Murray, now 90 years old, but in every discernible way still the teacher whose task is realistically, without self-parody or inflating dramatics, to personify for his students the maverick dictum I don't give a good goddamn to teach them that you don't have to be Al Capone to transgress. You just have to think. In human society, Mr. Ringgold taught us, thinking's the greatest transgression of all. Critical thinking 
Mr. Ringgold said, using his knuckles to wrap out each of the syllables on his desktop. There is the ultimate subversion. Uh, feels appropriate for today, does it not? And then, near the end of the book, is a long paragraph about Twelfth Night. Um, and since I recently uh, did Twelfth Night for ShakeTube, I thought it would be fun to share that with you guys. I had taken away his guns and his knives, but I knew that wasn't the end of it. Somehow or other, he was going to kill her. And thus the whirligig of time brings in his revenges, line of pros, recognize it? From the last act of Twelfth Night, Feste the Clown to Malvolio, just before Feste sings that lovely song, before he sings, a great while ago the world begun with hey ho, the wind and the rain, and the play is over. I couldn't get that line out of my head and thus the whirligig of time brings in his revenges. Those cryptogrammic G's, the subtlety of their de-intensification, those hard G's in whirligig, followed by the nasalized G of brings, followed by the soft G of revenges, those terminal S's, thus brings his revenges, the hissing surprise of the plural noun revenges, g, j, z, consonants sticking into me like needles, and the pulsating vowels, the rising tide of their pitch, engulfed by that. The low-pitched vowels giving way to the high-pitched vowels, the bass and tenor vowels giving way to the alto vowels, the assertive lengthening of the vowel I just before the rhythm shifts from iambic to trochaic, and the prose pounds round the turn for the stretch. Short I, short I, long I. Short eye, short eye, short eye, boom, revenges, brings in his revenges, his revenges, sibilated, his za, uh, driving back to Newark with Ira's weapons in my car, those ten words, the phonetic webbing, the blanket omniscience, I felt I was being asphyxiated inside Shakespeare. Now, to my mind, that is extraordinary prose, and this novel uh, has a lot of that going on. Um, I really felt like, actually, the last third of the book was the best third of the book, and the last two pages is one of the best endings that I've ever read. So, if you haven't read uh, I Married a Communist by Philip Roth, I uh, would highly recommend you, you think about doing so. When you next see me, uh, I will be eating smoked toads with my friend Dan, We'll be watching 28 Days Later, the zombie film directed by Danny Boyle, and we'll have a couple of little dachshunds in our laps.